Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for joining me here at Rock on the Range. You guys put on a hell of a performance earlier. What was it like from your perspective out there? I see it from mine. <laughs> it was it was fantastic. Yeah, really amazing crowd. We, we're still kind of dipping our toe into the world of American festivals, so it's nice to see that it ain't that different than back home. You get a bunch of dudes in black t-shirts and in a, in a field or a big amphitheater and, and you have a hell of a good time. So, no, really, really, really happy with the way things went and a kind of fitting end to our small tour here in America. Can you talk to me about the Ellipsis album a little bit? What was the recording process like? Like one or two songs in particular, what was the mindset like when you were putting it together? Well, move, moving on to it, this is our seventh album, so we really wanted to kind of rip up the rule book and feel that we we're starting again. We wanted to feel like a band making our first album. So we started to work with a new producer, Rich Costey, and almost the rules were, if we've done it before, we can't do it again. So we would start songs with, maybe with a vocal. We would put, instead of putting the guitars through a Marshall, we would put the drums through a Marshall and that sort of thing and just trying to explore the studio in ways that, that we hadn't before. I think the, the last, the previous records had all been recorded in quite a traditional way and this time we were a bit more open to using synthesizers and I mean rock, rock music fans hate to hear that stuff. We didn't ditch the guitars, don't worry. But we, we just tried to experiment a little. Like we promise, it still rocks. It's like it's still, we're still a rock band, don't worry. But it's got to feel refreshing a little bit to experiment for you, because I know no band wants to make the same album every time. No, you don't. You don't. Um, we're, we're so proud of all the, all the six records we've made before. We feel like the first three sit together as a trilogy, and then the next three sit together as a trilogy, and this feels like the beginning of the next trilogy. And, it's easier for us to think about things in threes. You don't get too far down the line. It's quite simple. Um, and, and yes, you don't want to make the same album again. You want to keep moving forward. And I think we took some risks on this record. Um, and we're, we're really proud of it. You know, I think that you, you got to feel that like you're moving forward, saying something different. And I think we did that with, with Ellipsis. So do you find now that, I mean, the music industry has changed so much and you guys are now seven albums into this, do you feel that there's more pressure to stay on the road? Because I feel like before, you know, an album would support a tour and now a tour seems to support an album. <laughs> well, we, we, we've been a touring band since we started. That's how we, how we cut our teeth. That's how we built up a fan base. Uh, so there's, there, there's no increase in pressure. It's always been a, an internal want to do the, to do the touring and the shows um, I mean before we started there wasn't even my space really um, so things have changed for bands uh, I think social media is a much bigger part of a, of a band's life be that for the good or for the bad I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out but it's certainly a great way to stay in touch with people and, and that's the important thing um, you know it, it, I don't know if I have an easy answer to the question. So much of life feels different with the internet and the internet age. And then the other half of life is the same as it's been for hundreds and thousands of years. People just want to be happy, be around people that make them happy. And, and that's how we feel in this band. That certainly with the three of us, that's what's important is to be happy and fulfilled. And that's what you want with an audience like today. You want to, you want to have a good time, you know? So what has it been like for you to know that your music's having an effect on so many fans, you know, when they're giving you that commentary back, is that still kind of like surreal for you guys? It's definitely surreal, that's that the correct word. Um, even even if, it, if it happens, even if it happens very often, which it, it doesn't happen very often, but it's still surreal, it's still very affecting. Um, I know for Simon writing the lyrics, when, when those lyrics help somebody through a difficult time and you know the old adage that a problem shared is a problem halved, I think there's a lot in that with music and music can, if you know somebody else is having a tough time, for some reason it, it makes you think well at least I'm not the only one and um, that, that's certainly a big part of our band, a big part of, of our connection with the audience is, is about that kind of idea that, that we might be able to help them through some of their problems. So when did music first begin speaking to you? 
Uh, I mean, it was all music was always in the household. When it started to become something that was was personal, was really about 13, 13, 14 when I stole my dad's record player. He'd moved on to CDs. He'd been tricked by the record industry into rebuying his entire record collection again on CD. <laughs> was like eight tracks and all yeah, exactly. that. Exactly, <laughs> it wasn't that, but it, 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 even though it, it was my dad's records, it was something personal to me because I had a choice about what I listened to and the, the tactile nature of records and the, the involvement of flipping the sides. So you end up listening to the same record just all day because every time it ate, you just flip the side. And So I mean, that, that was like, you know, I mean, it, it, not sort of groundbreaking for for in terms of a musical education, but bands like the Beatles and Steely Dan and Elvis Costello were, were at that point what I was listening to, and then we heard Nirvana, and it, it kind of all changed for us. It's all over. Then. It was all over. <laughs> Suddenly, instead of like Guns and Roses, who were five sex aliens from Los Angeles and leather with hairspray and big hair, there were suddenly three guys from a similarly wet town in the west coast of America and it, it, it felt, they felt, we felt a kinship to those guys and it made us think that, hell, we could, we could start a band, we could probably do that and um, we, we owe them a huge debt. So I know you guys took, what was it, about a year off to put this album together. Was it like a good time to kind of get refreshed? What did you guys do in that time period? If I had to time over, I would probably use it differently. Um, I, I, first few months were like scrambling around, being exhausted after a two year tour. I think we just slightly overdid it on the touring side from the previous album. So a little bit burnt out, a little bit of a shell of a person. And um, it takes a little bit of time to rebuild things. I mean, that, this sounds terrible. It wasn't that bad, but um, you know, it was, it was a, a, a questioning time. I mean, we were working, we were still, in, in the practice room working on songs. Simon took a, a, a trip to Los Angeles to do some writing and although we were out of the public eye, it was still a busy period for the band. Um, but if I had it over, I think I would slap myself about the face a little quicker. Like, come on, not three months on the couch, maybe a week, you know. But, um, you know, you learn as you go along. You, you learn from your mistakes. So have there been any surprising celebrity fans of Biffy Claro? Who's uh, kind of surprised you that you've seen out of the show? Um, quite recently we had a, a young man called Sam Palladio who plays Gunner in the hit TV show Nashville, which we're all huge fans I of. I love that show. <laughs> well, he, he tweeted the other day that he was coming to the show, so we, we tweeted back, whatever, and he came to say hello. and. Uh, I, I didn't actually know he was English. I was fooled by his his acting credentials and um, really lovely, lovely guy. Uh, quite an unlikely fan, perhaps, but um, you'll take any fans you can get. You know, you, you can't, I, re I realized that a long time ago, to pick and choose your fans is foolish. <laughs> but yeah, it's always nice when you, when you hear people, I mean, no, it, it doesn't have any greater importance because they're a celebrity or whatever, but it's always nice to hear somebody likes your music and, and it, if it's surprising, it has a kind of double, a double mind, uh, don't want to say mind fuck, I've just sworn, I probably shouldn't swear, but You're okay. we're okay, it's a total mind fuck then. <laughs> I love that you guys have not forgot the art of the music video too, because I love the visual side. I think it's really important. It's often the first um, interaction you have with a band, uh, especially now you can hear a band's name and you're straight onto YouTube watching all the videos. You know what size inside leg the drummer's got, and you know what the drum, the, the guitarist's favourite cheese is. There, there's so there's so many extraneous things that sometimes it's nice to have a. A, a, a summation of the of the song in a in a video, um, be it a great performance or a great story, and I think it is really important. It's a a bit of a dying art. I miss it, but I'm glad that you guys are still keeping it up. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's not always easy, you know, the long days. But uh, I have some sympathy for our friend uh, Sam from Nashville. Yeah. I can't imagine shooting for 20 hours a day every day and. But you know, videos are still fun. If you if you only make one every couple of months, they're great. <laughs> well, I want to 
thank you so much for taking a few minutes out to speak with me. I appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. Thank my you. Pleasure.